The scripture reading for today is in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. And it's on page 745 in your pew Bible. I'm reading from a giant text uh, version of the Bible. So it'll be slightly different than yours. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after he suffered by many infallible, infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John uh, truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, will come, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Good morning. Great to have everyone here today on this Memorial Day weekend. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not, uh, not always easy to find people who can come to church on uh, Memorial Day weekend. Hopefully we have people who are up at the cabin and watching online and, and joining us that way. Uh, I've actually, you may have noticed, I've been gone at quite a bit the last uh, few couple of months, I guess. This last Sunday I was gone because I was at our Wesleyan Church General Conference. General Conference, uh, this is the North American General Conference, uh, which is the, an, not annual, the meeting that we have every four years, although actually because of COVID it was postponed two years, and so it was six years ago that we had the last general conference, and this is where we do the, the business of the denomination as a whole, and I have to tell you, it was, a, it was a great time. I'll tell you more about the details of it next week when we have our local church conference, because I'm sure there were some pretty exciting things, I think, that happened there that I would love to, to tell you about, but let me just say this uh, in, in summary of what happened this past week. I really love the spirit of our denomination. Of course, with, our, with uh, you know, changes in society and all of that, it also means changes in the church. And you know, one, of the thing, one of the things that we actually did at General Conference is we shortened the discipline by about a third. Uh, just kind of taking out some structural things, not anything really controversial necessarily, but just some structural things about the way local churches and districts should operate. Uh, but, but there were some pretty significant things that happened and, you know, some, pretty, it, some issues that were pretty uh, uh, sharp disagreements, I would say. But the great thing about it is, is that we can have our opinions, we can voice our opinions, but everyone did so in a spirit of unity, and we ended the general conference, uh, you know, just by affirming the unity that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ. And in four years, we'll probably talk about some of those same issues and, and try to pass things, and some people will be for, and some people will be against, but at the end, in the end, I'm really pleased with the direction of our denomination, and also the, the spirit of unity that... Uh, that we are able to uh, show when we have those general conferences. So it really was a great time, and if you're really interested, next week at local church conference, uh, I'll tell you all about it. And in fact, uh, before we get into the sermon, there are a couple of things that I, that I want to 
uh, draw your attention to. I hope you have your bulletin. Uh, if you don't, this will be in the weekly emails. But we have a few things that are going to be happening over the next couple of weeks. Now, I've already mentioned it, that next week we are having our local church conference right after worship. And we're going to have a potluck, and there are instructions for there about uh, what you ought to bring for the potluck. And, uh, and here's what I'll say about it. This is something that we expect our members to be a part of. This is, you know, the business of our local church. But even if you're not a member, even if you're a regular attender, if you're someone who has a stake in our church, we would love for you to be there. You won't be able to vote, but at least you'll be able to hear kind of some of the plans for next year, hear about what uh, happened over the last year, and, uh, and just have a great time together as a church family. Okay, so that is next week, uh, June 5th, after worship service. Uh, And then the week after that, there are a couple of things on that weekend. Uh, The first one is on Saturday. We are going to do a guy's breakfast at 8.30 a.m., and, uh, and this is something that we want to get started over the summer. Of course, our small groups are ending uh, in the next week or so. And, uh, and so we just wanted to provide an opportunity for men to be able to get together regularly. And we'll discuss what that will look like during the summer and give you some input as to when you would like to meet. But the first one we're going to do is on 8:30 at 8.30 on June 11th. So I hope that you will be there for that. And we'll have great food and conversation and kind of determining what we want to do for the summer. And then, of course, uh, the next day is Church in the Park, and we are actually going to do a cornhole tournament, not during Church in the Park, but after Church in the Park, because during would be very distracting. So anyway, you can, you can take a look at the details of all of those things, but I just want you to be aware of those things that are happening uh, over the next couple of weeks. I hope that you uh, can be a part of them. All right, let's get into the message today. I think I've told this story before, but back in high school, I had a friend who attended the local Assembly of God church, which for those of you who don't know is a, is a charismatic denomination known for speaking in tongues and you know, things like that. Well, my friend invited me to a Tuesday evening service, and I grew up in a small town, so there wasn't much else to do. And, uh, and also, I was a church guy, and so I thought, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go to this service. Well, I had to work. I was working at Hardee's as a fry cook. I hated it, absolutely hated it. Uh, but, uh, but I had to work right up until the service started. But I told him, all right, when I get off work, I'll join you a little bit late. Well, I remember while I was at work, I got this really sharp pain in my side. And, uh, and it lasted for, for quite some time. Uh, but then even after it subsided, it made it really hard for me to breathe. So I had kind of labored breathing uh, from that point on. And, uh, and I powered through it uh, enough to finish work, and I decided, well, I'm going to head over to the church. Well, at the back of the sanctuary in the church was a bank of windows so you could see what was going on in the sanctuary as you were standing in the lobby. And so I was looking through those windows, looking for my friend to uh, try to see where he was so I could sit by him. I was pretty unfamiliar with the church at that point. And I didn't see him, but I thought, well, I'm here, so I might as well just go in. And, uh, and when I did, I witnessed something that I had never seen before in my life. This was no ordinary service, at least not for someone who grew up Wesleyan. Uh, you see, up on the platform, there was an evangelist, but he was more than just an evangelist, because when I settled in, I noticed that there were people who were standing lined up at the, at the altar there, and, uh, and he was going down the line, and he was laying hands on people, and every so often, he would like push them over, and they would fall backwards into the arms of of two men that were waiting there. And uh, so he started going down the line, and and all of that was happening. Uh, Some of them stayed upright. Some of them fell backward. It just seemed like a really weird thing to me at the time. Um, but, uh, But after doing this to a few people, he actually stepped back onto the platform, and he started to call people forward. But he wasn't calling them forward by name. He would say things like, "Uh, there's someone in the congregation here who's suffering from migraines. I want you to come forward and receive healing. There's someone who's just been diagnosed with cancer. I want you to come forward and and receive healing. And uh, and people would would go forward. Now, never having seen this before, I was a bit skeptical about it. And uh, until he said, there is someone in the sanctuary here who experienced a sharp pain in his right side and now it even makes it hard to breathe I want you to come forward 
And when I heard it, I, I was kind of freaking out a little bit. Like, what in the world? You know, because I didn't tell anyone at work. I didn't call my parents. I didn't tell anyone when I went into the church. And so I'm like, I, this seems really specific, and I'm not sure what to do with this. But I thought, well, I guess I'll go forward. And, uh, and so I did. And I was standing at the altar on the left side of the platform there, and he had made his way down the line. There were other people there. He was healing people and, and putting his hands on their head, and some of them would go down and some of them wouldn't. And, and pretty soon he got to me. And, and when he did, he spoke to me, and he said, why are you up here? Now, of course, the natural question that I'm thinking in my head, I didn't say this out loud. I said, well, you called me up here, so you tell me, right? <laughs> but, uh, but I wasn't snarky like that, so I basically just said to him, I said, well, I'm the one who, who had the pain in his side. And so he put his hand on my side, and he started to pray. And as he started to pray, I felt this warm sensation right where he put my hand. And, and then this sort of warm, and I guess what I would call a healing sensation, started to emanate throughout my body. And it was pretty cool. I didn't know what was going on. But I also remember at that point, I've kind of lost focus because I remember the only thing that I was thinking was, don't push me over. Don't push me over. <laughs> don't, I don't want to go down. That's all, that's all I was saying. And, uh, and he didn't push me over. I didn't go down or anything. But, you know, that, that happened. And then he moved on to the next person. And I was left standing there going, I'm not sure what just happened. I don't know what's going on. But I would say that this was probably the first experience that I had in my life with, like, the obvious power of the, the Holy Spirit. Now, I didn't have any kind of medical diagnosis, so I'm not one who would say I was absolutely healed or whatever. I do believe that it was a sign to me, though. I do believe that it was the work of the Holy Spirit that was happening, and I have never forgotten about it in my life. Well, today, we are making the transition from the Gospel of Luke into the book of Acts. Now, I think I mentioned when we started talking about the book of Luke that Acts is kind of the sequel to the Gospel of Luke. In fact, Luke starts his book, uh, uh, the book of Acts, with the line, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And what he's talking about there is the, what we call the Gospel of Luke. And, and what we're going to find is that as we move from the Gospel of Luke into the book of Acts, the focus changes a little bit. Because it changes from a focus on Jesus to a focus on the Holy Spirit. Now, that's kind of a false dichotomy there. Of course, the Holy Spirit always focuses on Jesus. But the Holy Spirit actually becomes the main actor in the book of Acts. Oftentimes, it's called the Acts of the Apostles. But the truth is, it's really the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who empowers everything that happens in Acts. Now, it's appropriate today that we talk about this particular passage because this past Thursday was something known as Ascension Day. Uh, it's, the, it's the day, 40 days after Easter, that we commemorate Jesus' ascension into heaven. Now, how many of you have celebrated Ascension Day before? Okay, a couple of you, a few of you. Now, I, I guess I want to say this. Most likely, if you grew up in an evangelical church, you probably have not. If you grew up in a, in a more liturgical church, then most likely you have. But in evangelical churches, we tend to celebrate and commemorate, of course, Christmas and Easter, but also things like the 4th of July and Mother's Day and Father's Day and Memorial Day like it is today. But no church I've been a part of, including the ones that I've led, have ever commemorated Ascension Day. But today we're going to do it because I've come to realize that not only, that, that the ascension is not just sort of an interesting uh, footnote in the story of Jesus, it's actually a part of the gospel story. It makes a great story even better if that were possible. And I want you to follow me here. You see, back in the gospel of John, Jesus gave last minute instructions to his disciples, because, and this is what he said. He said, very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Okay, now think about that for a minute. Jesus says, it's better for you that I go away. Right? Seems kind of strange, doesn't it? I mean, we believe that Jesus coming to earth was good news, 
Because when we look at Jesus, we can see who we are created to be. We believe that his teaching was good news because we have a guide for how to live our lives. We believe that his suffering and death are good news because it means that we can be free from the sin of our past. We believe the resurrection is good news because it means that we have a hope and a future. But Jesus tells us that there's something that's even better than those things. What is it? That he goes away. Why? Well, because when he goes away, he sends the Holy Spirit. And yet, it seems that outside of charismatic circles, this might be one of the most neglected aspects of the gospel today. Now, why would that be? Well, I think maybe some of it is, is that Christians don't really understand. Being led by the Holy Spirit is something that is dangerous and it seems subjective. It's, it's risky and it can seem kind of weird to people. Like, I mean, the story that I told Uh, to open the sermon. That seems kind of weird, doesn't it? I mean, certainly to, to most people. And yet the Holy Spirit is all over the pages of Scripture. You know, as much as we would love it if Jesus would just show up here in the flesh in this sanctuary, the Bible tells us that it's even better that when we become believers, the Holy Spirit comes to, to, to each of us to connect us to God and to guide our steps daily. And so what we see in the book of Acts is example after example after example of the Holy Spirit at work in the world. And as believers, we are invited, actually we're commissioned, to participate in the work of God through the Holy Spirit. Well, Holly's actually going to talk about this next week, and before I steal her thunder, we better just get on to this passage today. Uh, so we started in Acts chapter 1, uh, we read a little bit from, and, and actually let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and read here uh, from Acts chapter 1, we're going to start with verses 1 through 3. This is what Luke writes, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, uh, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over the period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Now, this is Luke's summary of the gospel. It's his summary of his book. Okay, Jesus came, he taught the people, he did miracles, he suffered, died, and rose again, and appeared to the disciples, giving many convincing proofs that he was alive. Okay, in other words, after Jesus rose, he explained everything that the disciples had experienced only in light of the resurrection. He helped them to make sense of everything that happened in his life. Well then, after his summary, we see in verse 4 that Luke shares a a flashback to a particular instance in Jesus' ministry, and this is what he writes. He says, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now what happens is, is that flashback then sets the scene for what Jesus is about to teach them in response to a question that the disciples ask him uh, at, the, at the time of the ascension, right? Uh, we see this in verse 6. Here's the question. Then the disciples gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now this question that the disciples asked reflects the sort of nationalistic fantasy about the Messiah. That the Messiah would come and set up Israel, maybe the Israelite empire, where they could then impose the kingdom of God on all the other nations. Now, of course, this fantasy isn't something that's unique to first century Jews. There's always been a temptation to confuse the work of God with the work of government or the kingdom of God, even for Christians. We see it very early on in Christian history with the Holy Roman Empire, all the way to modern day Christian nationalists who believe, for instance, that America is God's special nation. And Christians throughout history have tried to bring about the kingdom of God to, uh, to, or a Christian society through political or military power. It was the same for the disciples. They thought the same thing. But actually, Jesus' teaching about the kingdom of God was very different from this. 
You see, Jesus started his ministry by preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. And what he means by that is that in Jesus' arrival with his healing and teaching that people could start to get a glimpse of God's kingdom right here and now. But of course, it's not something that's contained in one nationality or country or ethnicity. His was a kingdom without national or ethnic borders. But Jesus also said that while the kingdom has arrived, it's not actually fully here yet, that there is more to come. This is what theologians call the already but not yet nature of the kingdom of God. That it's, it's, that time, it's kind of like that time between when the president is elected and so you know that there's going to be a change of regime um, and yet, it's not quite there yet. We're not quite to the inauguration. People are getting excited for it, and there are some things that are happening, and the, the cabinet is, is getting put together and all of that, but it's not come to full power quite yet. And too often, Christians have seen that, that in that moment, in that in-between, between where we can see glimpses of the kingdom of God and where the kingdom of God comes in its fullness, that it's our job to bring about the, the kingdom of God. And this is, of course, not something just reserved for Christians. People try to do it all the time. Any time we try to set up some kind of utopia, whether it's Christian or communist, uh, we, that, that's what it means, is that we are trying to set up this perfect society, this kingdom of God within our own power, and it always ends in failure, and oftentimes even in disaster. Of course, there were some Jews who tried to bring about the kingdom of God by human effort, though that doesn't seem to be the case for the disciples here. It doesn't seem like they were trying to, to do that. They just wanted to know when Jesus was going to do it. They wanted to know when the Messiah was going to reveal himself fully, and all of a the sudden then uh, Israel would be on top. And of course this is the same question that Christians have had all throughout history. When is it going to happen? Okay, and this is why end times preachers who, who say that they've figured out the date of Jesus' return, get such a huge following. This happened many times throughout history, and all of them have been let down. Of course, this is something that people want to know. But of course, Jesus bursts their bubble in verse 7 when he says this. He said, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. In other words, that date is up to God, and it's really none of your business. Okay, so don't concern yourself with trying to figure out things that you just can't know. Instead, what you have to do is you have to focus your attention on what you do in the meantime. And what exactly is that? What are we to do in the meantime? Well, let's keep going. Verse 8. Jesus says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So, what are, what are his disciples supposed to do while they're waiting for this future time when Jesus comes back and the power of the kingdom is revealed fully? We are to be witnesses empowered by the Holy Spirit. Okay, and we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at what this means. Okay, first let's talk about the Holy Spirit for a little bit. The Bible mentions several roles that the Holy Spirit plays in our life. For instance, here's, here's a little list. Okay? The Holy Spirit teaches and reminds us of Jesus' words. The Holy Spirit testifies about Jesus, convicts the world of sin, guides believers into the truth, helps us in our weaknesses, gives spiritual gifts for the building up of the church. And I'm sure you could come up with many other things. And these things are, are clear from Scripture and they're all very important roles of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is here to work in us and to grow us into Christ's likeness. But throughout the book of Acts, Luke focuses on another role of the Holy Spirit. In fact, he would say it's maybe even more important. That the Holy Spirit empowers believers to be sent out into the world to be witnesses to Jesus. In story after story, in the book of Acts, we see that the Holy Spirit is not just working in believers, but he's working through believers. Okay, think about all the songs. I, I was doing this uh, this week, all the songs that we sing about the Holy Spirit. Most of them actually talk about intimacy with God. 
And this is true whether they're hymns or contemporary songs. I couldn't find, and maybe you can, if you, if you th- think of one afterwards, I couldn't find songs about the Holy Spirit empowering us for witness. And, and yet Jesus is very clear about this critical role that the Holy Spirit plays. Witness is the first thing that the disciples did when the Holy Spirit came on them. And yet, we tend to not talk about it all that much. We tend to emphasize all the other roles of the Holy Spirit. Why do we do that? Well, I actually think that it's because this is a way that we can tame the Holy Spirit. You see, intimacy with God is great. And I think we like, you know, those who have intimacy with God, it's it's a great thing. And and using our gifts in the church, it's cool, but it's really safe as well. Being convicted of sin, well, we don't like that quite as much, but even that can be kind of tame because, you know, we can deal with that. We can deal with it privately, on our own. The Holy Spirit uh, can convict us and empower us to, to live new kinds of lives. But being a witness, and that's, that's uncomfortable. We have to put ourselves out there. I mean, after all, what do we say when we're sharing Jesus with someone else? What if someone has questions that we can't answer? What if they think we're weird or in a cult or something like that? Well, that, it's easier just not to deal with that. And yet, the last words that Jesus said to his disciples, you will be my witnesses. And that's intimidating. In fact, I suspect that maybe that's the word that comes to mind whenever we uh, mention another word that we call evangelism, right? It's intimidating. But we can't escape it. Jesus says that part of our job as believers is to be witnesses. Now, that's, of course, the language that Luke uses. Matthew uses some other language there when we see in what we call the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. All right, so that's the hard part. But here's the good part, is that Jesus says that we don't do it alone. He ends the Great Commission in Matthew, of course, by saying, and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And how is Jesus with us? Through the Holy Spirit. Luke records Jesus saying this, wait for the gift that my Father has promised. Now, when Jesus spoke these words, there was no Christianity. I want you to think about that for a minute. There were no churches, there was no 2,000 years of Christian theological history, there was no internet with apologetic websites, there was none of that. So if the message of Jesus, the message of the kingdom, and the peace that it offered was to go around, it had to be carried by believers who saw themselves as witnesses guided by the Holy Spirit. It's the only way that the word was going to go out. Now, our day is a little bit different. They lived in a pre-Christian society. We live in what most people call a post-Christian society, which means that while there are still some artifacts of Christianity in our society, it's no longer the default way of life. Christian institutions are still around. After all, we're here, right? But they've lost a lot of influence. uh, And so they maybe don't have the power that they once did. You know, there was a day when you could say about a church, if you build it, they will come. Or you could have a revival, set up a tent somewhere and and people would come. A nice new church building or a great kids program would attract the masses. You just needed some clever advertising that showed that your church programs were better than the church down the street and people would flock to your church. In fact, churches would grow even without individual Christians having to go through the trouble of witnessing. In essence, evangelism was outsourced to the organization. Now, there are still some people who are still up for a good program, right? But the COVID pandemic of the last couple of years and the scandals that we've seen in churches around the country have slowed that considerably. 
And what it means is, is that while individual Christians witnessing has always been important, our current situation has made personal evangelism as critical as it was in the day of Jesus. In fact, the growth and health of the church depends on it. But of course, this is not just about the growth and the health of the church. We witness because God loves people and He wants them to find life in Him. He brings life and health and peace. He gives purpose beyond our short-term desires. He gives us a hope and a future when life is hard that extends beyond this temporary world to eternity. And as we like to say, life with Jesus is just better. We believe that the good news of the kingdom truly is good news. Now, if that's the case, is there any other good news that we have in life that we're not just dying to share? Now, it's not my purpose to paint a a dire picture of the world. I actually don't think, think that things are dire for Christians, believe it or not. Are there changes? Yes. Are there challenges? Of course. There have always been challenges. But I also believe that we are living in a time where people genuinely are searching. Now, our biggest challenge is that people no longer have faith in institutions. The institutions that used to give their lives stability and meaning. And I'm not just talking about the church. I'm talking about all institutions. And, but it does include the church. It's kind of like the Wild West out there. But people are spiritually hungry. The God-shaped void that Augustine talked about so many years ago is still there within people. There is still hurt and confusion and a hunger for something that people can count on. Eternity is still written on people's hearts. But their first instinct is not to go to institutions. What's their first instinct? Well, maybe their first instinct is to go to media. You know, which means that we probably ought to be there as well. But, but I think they also go to look for people. They look for people who live with purpose in a world of chaos. They need people who have a deep sense of peace in an anxious society. They need people who are reconcilers in a world that forces people to choose sides. Now, I don't think that the church as an institution is irrelevant by any means. I hope not, actually. But what more than ever the world needs is for believers to embrace our role as witnesses. So, if witnessing isn't a normal part of our life, how do we get started? Well, according to Jesus, we need to learn to live by the Holy Spirit. And how do we do this? Well, first we have to tune in to the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, the goal is not to study or understand the doctrine of the Spirit. Of course, that's helpful to, to do that. But the apostles in the book of Acts didn't have the benefit of thousands of years of theology. But what they did was they tuned in. They learned to listen to the Holy Spirit. See, it's not enough to be well-versed in the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We have to learn to listen to the voice of the Spirit. I mean, think, you can think about it like radio waves. Okay? Radio waves are all around us. You can't see them, but of course everyone believes in them. Now why? Because when you have the right equipment and when you tune in to the right frequency, then you get the messages. You don't have to understand how a radio works. You just have to be able to tune in. Okay, now, many Christians will pay attention to the Holy Spirit when we're praying or studying Scripture or in worship service. But what about the time when we're not doing religious things? When we're at the gym, or at the grocery store, or at work, or school, or on vacation? Do you know what it sounds like for the Holy Spirit to speak to you? Do you know when the Holy Spirit is moving you? How do you know that? Well, you have to cultivate a life of listening. Whatever you're doing to find a way to keep yourself aware of the Holy Spirit. And that might mean putting up reminders regularly. To, uh, to regularly pray, Holy Spirit, I am open to hearing you speak in this moment. And then you have to listen. And when you can hear, then you'll be sensitive to things like the conviction of the Holy Spirit, convicting you of sin, to encouragement, to 
Uh, compassion. The Holy Spirit will give you a heart of compassion for people. He'll help you to be able to see people. And you'll be able to hear where the Holy Spirit is working, inviting you to join in on that work. And that's the second part of it. Is it expect that the Holy Spirit is at work not just in you, but in the world as well. See, just like the disciples, the Holy Spirit doesn't just want to work in you, the Holy Spirit wants to work through you. Now, sometimes we think, uh, we look at people and we think, oh, there's no way that God could ever work in his life. There's no way, or, or there's no way that he would ever be interested even if the Holy Spirit was working. Don't believe that for a second. I mean, throughout history, God has changed people that you never would have believed could be reached on the outside. And he almost always does it through another believer who is willing to listen and cooperate with him in that work. You see, God, whoever it is, whoever you meet in daily life, God might already be speaking to that person, whether through circumstances or dreams or impressions uh, that are in their head that are causing them to think. But if they're not tuned in to the Holy Spirit, they might not even realize that it's God speaking. And so, if you're tuned in, then you can be the one who's listening and you can be the one who suggests, you know, maybe this is God speaking to you. Maybe God is drawing you in this moment. And so you have to keep your eyes out for people. Keep your eyes out for people who are in pain. Keep your eyes out for people who are confused or questioning. And then ask the Holy Spirit to give you the words to speak. And then this is the hardest part right here. Take a step of faith. Say something. Get involved. But you don't have to get up there and say, God told me this. You can just get in there and you can start asking questions. If you see someone who's hurting, you can ask if you can pray for them. And then if they say yes, then absolutely, just pray for them right there. I've only been turned down one time in my life when I've done that. See, we're oftentimes more concerned about looking weird than we are about seeing God change lives. And so we spend much of our lives doing things that don't really amount to much. But as D.L. Moody once said, our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at something that does not really matter. Now as we transition from the book of Luke into the book of Acts, I want to do more than just talk about the theology of the Holy Spirit. I want us to learn to become people who are led by the Holy Spirit. And we're going to have months to work on this, all right? So let's start right away and, uh, and let's practice it as we go through it. I want us to learn to be people who are led by the Holy Spirit. And as we are led by the Holy Spirit, that we will embrace our role as witnesses to the change that Jesus can bring in people's lives. Okay, now, this is a theme that you're going to see throughout the book of Acts. And so, in your notes, you're going to find some questions for reflection and discussion. And this is going to sort of set the foundation for the next few months for us. And so, here's what I want you to do to start to make this practical. And we'll keep reminding you of it and we'll talk about it more as time goes on. But, but here are some steps that I want you to take. Okay, the first one is this. First of all, make a list of three friends or family members, acquaintances, people that you know, that you would like to get to know Jesus. Then I would like for you to commit to praying for them every day. And then look for opportunities with them to be a witness. So tune into the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. And finally, Take a step of faith and share with them. Now, the worship team is coming up and, and uh, they're, going to, uh, they're going to sing a song and I'm not asking you to sing along. You can listen to the words. But, but actually, what I want you to do is I want you to reflect on these things. I want you to start to get this list in your head. Okay? And, and the point is not just to have projects and all of that sort of thing, but, but I want you to pray right now and say, okay, Holy Spirit, I want you to show me three people that you want to come to know Christ through me. 
And during that time, then write them down on your piece of paper and then transfer them over to a journal or write them down in a place where you will see them every day so that you can pray for them. And then, empowered by the Holy Spirit, take that step and share. Be witnesses. If you found that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is good news, then it should be something that we all want to share. So I want you to take a couple of minutes and consider your list, listen to the Holy Spirit, and see what it says to you. we thank you that you have promised your Holy Spirit to be with us. You know that, I mean, just living life sometimes can be intimidating, trying to, you know, figure out how to be a, a parent or a boss or a friend. So many things are confusing. And yet you've said that you have not left us alone. You've not left us as orphans, but you have left your Holy Spirit 
to guide us. And so I pray that over the next few months as we uh, think more and, and read more stories about the Holy Spirit that we wouldn't settle for just nice stories or intellectual understanding of the Holy Spirit but that each of us would learn to, to tune in. That we would learn to have a conversational relationship with you where we are aware of your presence and we're listening for your guidance in our lives for whatever it is, whether it's conviction or you know, wisdom or where you want us to step in and, and be your witnesses. God, would you give us boldness and courage to, to be the people the witnesses that you have called us to be. God, strengthen us, and I, I pray that the presence of your Holy Spirit would be so thick and so powerful in our lives that it's easy to catch on. We start to live in a, a different way as believers. God, we need you to empower your church to do what you've called us to do. And so we submit ourselves to you. We are open to your Holy Spirit. So speak to us, guide us, and empower us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.